like that's <laughs> Man, what a natural pose. That was beautiful. That's thumbnailing for you. All right. Hello there, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Mojmoha. And I'm the Viper. And this is episode 12 of the Town Center, your podcast dedicated to all things Age of Empires. And 12 episodes, at least in theory, means today we're celebrating one year of the Town Center podcast. So um, happy anniversary, bro. Happy anniversary to you as well. It's been, yeah. a, been a long journey already, and it's been fun, what, right? What a ride. <laughs> what a ride, indeed. Actually, I was thinking last episode was actually a lot closer to the actual anniversary date because we released the first episode March 23rd, 2023, mm -hmm. and our Talk With Doubt was released March 21st. But, you know, who's counting? As you can see, I'm definitely not counting. Uh, by the way, did you notice what I did differently there in the introduction? I said your podcast dedicated to all things Age of Empires. Let's see if you've been paying attention. Are we talking to me now or to the viewers? I'm, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you, obviously. Um, I'm not sure if I noticed the difference. All things uh, dedicated. I'm going to take that as a no. I didn't say your monthly podcast. And that's because... Clever. In case, in case you've missed the announcement last episode, from now on, we'll be recording two episodes per month that obviously come to the expense of us recording in person every single time because it would be a bit hard for both of us to justify so much traveling, especially now that you moved. Speaking mm. of which, you've moved. I have how, moved, yeah. How are things in the new home, my friend? For all the headaches you had to go through, I sure hope it's been worth it. <laughs> I can have this now. The pictures are nice, at least. Oh, the pictures uh... are nice. <laughs> No, it's been nice. Obviously, like the one thing I've learned with moving is that um, if you build your own house, every day some you stumble upon something new that you didn't realize you needed, didn't realize was missing. Like every single day has been like, ah, oh, shit, we have to do that as well. Sorry, I'm not sure if we're allowed to say shit. I, mean, I think said we're shit not many allowed. Times. I think you're not allowed to say it in like the first thirty seconds of a video. Uh, I think we pass past that. Okay, so we're okay. fine. Yeah, we're if fine. we're not, just beep it out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> But yes, a lot of extra work comes with the building a house that I didn't expect to be there. But I mean, we're we're settling in and uh, slow and steady things are getting better. My room is also coming together better as well. I finally, like, I've had this acoustic foam panels, you know, that it makes the audio better on paper and removes echo and things like that. It still sounds shit, by the way, but... I know, fine. but uh, it's getting there. But I've had yeah, them there was another with, shit. I've had them attached with, like, two-sided tape. And they'd be like, every single day, two, three, four of them fall off. And it's been so annoying. But now I've used, like, this... Uh, adhesive uh, spray and now everything is like glued so nicely together it's so my room is coming together the house we have moved in and sloan said everything is good how are things with you nelson uh, things are fine but i'm not done i remember you put like <laughs> a picture of like an air conditioning above your above yes! your door and people are like actually that's not the best place for an air conditioning <laughs> i like how people always like to find stuff to complain yeah, there's about always something, right? i mean like uh, I, and then i was like asking everyone like why is it a bad position and nobody I, said why. I still don't really know why, but uh, apparently it's not the most <laughs> ideal position. But it's like, who cares? It's it's. I've used it like two, three times now already, and it works completely fine. So amazing, amazing. Yes. By the way, when was the house supposed to be ready? Wasn't it like last year or something? Uh, Nelson, we're, we're not heading out that wrong. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. I'm done with that. <laughs> Move on. <laughs> Move on. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's find it. I. Actually, my parents, they also built a house when we were like young. I think I was 10. Mm -hmm. I was around 10. So I don't remember a lot of this stuff, but I do remember my father complaining all the time about how bad the architect was, how yeah. badly built the house was, and so many delays and stuff like that. He's an engineer, though. So I think there's often a bit of a rivalry, you know, between architects and engineers. <laughs> so they might have played a role. But yeah, I hear building a house uh, comes with a healthy dose or unhealthy dose of hiccups. That's what I've heard. Hopefully the first and last time I'll have to do this. <laughs> Let's put it like that. <laughs> in any case, our friends, in today's show, the next S-tier tournament for Age of Empires 2 has been announced, and it will be Warlords 3, organized by MEMP. There are a few differences to the prior iterations of the tournament, and we'll be discussing what those are and all the other known details. Then, this is something that happened a couple of weeks ago, but we haven't actually had the chance to discuss it. The AM members have disbanded, and believe Ooh. it or not, Ooh. it's actually good news, and we'll talk about why. We all, yeah, 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 yeah. I have, I have some good news on that front. We also have a new POP available for folks to test, and it brings with it not only one, but two very controversial new features. As always, my friends, your support is absolutely crucial for the longevity of this podcast. So if you happen to enjoy the work we're doing here, especially now that we're increasing the frequency of the show, make sure to make your voices heard by liking, commenting, and most importantly, subscribing to the channel. To those of you who prefer to listen to us on Spotify, we have some very important changes to announce here. 
we've had a lot of people ask us, believe it or not, Viper, to release the episodes on Spotify at the same time we release them on YouTube. And starting today, for a two euro a month subscription fee, we're giving folks the opportunity to listen to our episodes on Spotify a few hours before they're uploaded on YouTube. This applies to both the Town Center episodes we'll be releasing each month now, as well as whatever other long format videos we make, such as, you know, post match talks and quizzes and whatever else. So this would be an amazing way for you to support us, to support the show, to ensure we can keep producing this content for you. And all of it is absolutely optional, of course. After 48 hours, all episodes will still be available for free, as it's always been the case. And again, I want to underscore this applies to Spotify only. On YouTube, it's business as usual and nothing has changed. But let's talk about some Age of Empires what? too. <laughs> but did I say it like that? I hate it when I do <laughs> no, that. It was completely fine. <laughs> I, hate it. I hate it when I do that. Okay, yeah, so Warlords 3 is coming. Mm-hmm. There are four invited players, you, Tato, Hera, and Yo, which were the top four, I think that was the how the criteria was made, right? It was the top four of the previous edition? I imagine so. I don't really remember, but yeah, I think I think that sounds about right. Yeah, and you guys wore the top four, so I'm pretty yeah. sure that was the case. And then 12 more players will have the chance to qualify for a total of 16. This one is a $45,000 prize pool sponsored by Microsoft, and the main event will take place in the first week of June. We won't have to wait that long to see some action, though, because the month of May will be full of qualification matches. There will be two qualifiers, and the first one starts April 29th. Uh, so that would be roughly in two weeks. And Orin, you know what? I Actually, I was a bit confused, because, uh, or conf- surprised, rather, because I was expecting to see either a King of the Desert or maybe mm-hmm. a completely new tournament, but that was not the case. My guess is that Mem sort of agrees with something that we've been discussing here a couple of times already, which is I don't think there's days there's like a lot of appetite for single map tournaments anymore, especially S-tier tournaments. So I wonder... After five editions, do you think this means rip King of the Desert? Um, I mean, like five, five, number five is a nice place to stop it in some ways, right? You had Ooh, that's a now, guess. And you see now with five editions, and you kind of stop mm-hmm. there, allegedly. <laughs> um, I, I know I keep making that joke. People might think I have some inside information that I know that Neil is going to make a comeback down the road or, road or something, but that's not the case. I'm just like my own personal wish and prediction and hope is that. Somewhere in like a year or two, Nelly feels like, oh, I want to get back on the, in the saddle and he will come back with NAC6. But, you know, uh, five is a nice number to stop. King of the Desert 5 happened. I mean, King of the Desert 5, in hindsight, I'm not sure how happy he was with the event. Like the final was a stomp. I mean, I don't know who was part of that, but uh, it wasn't a <laughs> great I actually don't final. remember. Did you? Did you? Wow, well, it it's got to be you. Let's carry on. Uh, and then um, <laughs> we had like... Um, but still, like Battle of Africa, the team game thing, right? He has already said that he doesn't really feel like doing a team game event now that Hera is in GL. Hmm. Obviously, that was kind of out of the equation. So that leaves, if he wants to go down steady, known, comfortable paths, Warlords is the only option left, right? And I think Warlords has always been a success. And the variety of maps is always a bonus. And like Warlords was the first time we had these um, category, map categories, right? Where we drafted one map from each category. Absolutely, right. and I think it was also the first with the nine villagers start, if I'm not mistaken, or, or no, no. no uh, the first S tier probably. S- yeah, that's correct. correct. Um, yeah, I understand it. I think also Warlords is a really fun tournament, and if I was like, if Mem was like, hey, which one of my previous tournaments do you want me to host again? I would have said probably Battle Africa first, obviously, but then hmm. Warlords would have been the only one tournament I would have asked for, right? Uh, so I, I do think there is truth to that that one map tournaments are not going to be as popular anymore. But King right. of Desert still has such a strong place in the history of Age of Empires at this point that I don't know if I think that's like pushed to the side and will never return, right? But for now, I'm happy with Warlords. Yeah, I, I think King of the Desert was always an absolutely amazing tournament in the past, mm. mostly because Arabia was always considered to be the most balanced map and uh, probably the only balanced map in the game. I just mm. talked with Neely about this, uh, and I highly recommend folks watch that video. But we were talking about the WSVG tournament, and in that tournament, Rio basically loses the whole semifinal because in the fifth game, the last game of a series of best of five, he gets like an atrocious Baltic yeah. generation. He doesn't yeah. have any deep fish. Yo has deep fish. And the game is basically there. It's basically over right there. Uh, however, in recent years, again, we've talked about this. I think map scripters have become so good at sort of understanding what makes maps interesting and balanced that I think we have several maps now that are just as interesting and balanced as Arabia. 
And I also have to say, I don't know if you agree with this, I have to say Arabia has become, in my feeling, a lot less random over the years, you know, with less variation. When I, I mean, when I think about some of the crazy generations we used to have in AOC, <laughs> I feel like we don't really see those anymore. And again, that's probably good for competition, but makes it harder to justify dedicating a full tournament to Arabia alone. That would be my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to agree. Uh, we had like a show match yesterday, GL against uh, Team China. And in by the way, close, close show match. By yeah, the way. it was really fun, right? But during that show match, we talked about like, oh, we miss how we used to play 44 Arabia in the past, right? Mm -hmm. We couldn't pick our positions. Who spawns right. in pocket, who spawns in flank. And the randomness of that, like suddenly you have like such a weird civ dynamic. It made it a lot more fun as well, right? Now everything is just so predictable. Oh, it's scouts from pocket. Unless they go Burmese and goth and do their... <laughs> but it looks douche as a stable or something. Um, yeah, it, Arabia is just at this point, I wouldn't say it's boring, but it's just like, it's predictable. Hmm. Like you're not going to see anything new or any cool strategies. It's like mostly whoever executes the archer rush, the scout rush better. And that's kind of who wins the game, which is also a part of Age of Empires. But mm -hmm. I, for me, team games has always been more like, I want to see more strategy. I want to see more at the big picture. I don't want to just see like, oh, these, these guys are microing their archers and scouts great. Mm -hmm. which everyone at this level does at this point so yeah. you know the funny thing about this for me is that we used to cry that we really wanted to have pick positions for arabia mm. we need pick positions and it's one of those things that actually came and i actually think was bad <laughs> for um okay you're not going to agree with this because you're a competitive player but for like the regular the regular folk like the 99.9 percent .9 of the of the player base i think it's actually bad because it makes it a lot more predictable as you said and you know people will pick sieve any single day every single day of the week to get their archer sieve on the flank and to get their knight sieve on the pocket I miss those games where you would get like, I don't know, a Korean's pocket on Arabia. Uh, <laughs> and what are you going to do? Uh, that would sort of ask for you to be more creative and try to come up with crazy strategies. I feel like we don't have that anymore. Well, yes and no. It can, it's good and bad, right? I, I, I don't know how ladder experience will be for, let's say, 1,000 ELO, 1,200 ELO, when the flanks start blaming their pocket, not knowing that, oh, he's a way worse pocket than the other guy, right? It's gonna get full blame or whatever. Uh, well, yeah, let's get blame happens anyway. Whether yeah, it's good or bad, it could be even worse, right? <laughs> I think great. for competitive tournaments, the picking positions is required. For there's a lot of maps where you need to have that option, right? Hmm. Not like Arabia is not necessarily the best example for that, but it's like one of those give and take, right? I, I think in the end, it's a very good addition to Age of Empires. Uh, I mean, we did get off trail a little bit here. We were talking about initially. Um, uh, well, we're gonna get back to it. Arabia. We're gonna, yeah. we're gonna get back to it. Yeah. Yeah. I guess having the option is good. Uh, I'm not sure if it should be enforced on the ladder, but having the option is good. Yeah, and, and speaking of team games, there were a lot of people complaining, or not complaining, but sort of being sad that this was not a team game, the tournament that Ma'am just announced, mm -hmm. because he was one of the only ones who was still organizing like S-tier team game tournaments, like Battle of Africa, for example. But again, this is something we've discussed last episode with doubts, um, why tournaments are not very likely to organize team game tournaments these days. Though I have to say... I was just browsing through T90's YouTube channel the other day. Do you know what's his most popular video with esports commentary? I'm going to guess it's a team game tournament match. Okay, which one do you think it is? Oof, most popular uh, team game. It involves you. <laughs> Obviously. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's no. the 2v2 World Cup final between ah, Norway and China. Ah, that makes so that sense, would yeah. be UNMBL against UN Leagues. It has a lot more than Hidden Cup Finals, for example. Yeah, but World, World Cups also pull in something different, right? When the there's title is World Cup, it's suddenly like so much broader than just like a tournament. So I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, but it just goes to show that there's a lot more potential in team game tournaments that people seem to realize, in my opinion. By the way, do you know what's the second most watched <laughs> on T90? Let me guess, a World Cup? <laughs> yes, a World Cup. The other one, the one before it, that was uh, between okay. uh, China, uh, again, Yo and Lix against Finland, Max and Rubenstock. So I think there's a lot of potential for team game tournaments here. If it does well on YouTube, it might not do as well on Twitch, but still maybe maybe well, worth considering. 2v2 is with Lix is going to hit the views no matter what. It's always going to be crazy. It's uh, always funny. I actually checked like the first comment on each video. Everybody was mentioning how crazy Lix is and yeah. how funny it is watching a Lix gameplay. 
Okay, so then uh, back to Warlords 3. There are a few interesting changes in the format this time around. The main event will be played from June 1st to June 9th, and it will be a one week only single elimination bracket, which, you know, apart from Hidden Cup, we don't really see very often in Age of Empires 2. But then on the flip side, we have two qualifiers that will span two weeks each. Again, mm -hmm. uh, this is a big departure from the previous editions where we would usually see like these two day weekend qualifiers only, you know, so we would miss a lot of matches during those qualifiers. And I got to say, from a viewer's perspective, I love this. Uh, this gives a lot of spotlight to the qualifiers, which these days, let's be honest, tend to be really interesting and sometimes yeah. even more competitive than main events. <laughs> and I also like that it's a very short main event, very cutthroat, which again, as a viewer, makes it a lot easier to sort of plan around the event. It's very easy mm -hmm. for me to say, let me take three days off from work and then I can watch the event. It's a lot harder if it's two weeks, right? Yeah. Um, Right, but I wonder how invited players, which would be your case, feel about this, though, because it could mean you play one series and you're out. <laughs> I don't want to think that's going to happen to you, but it could happen. <laughs> so how do you guys feel about it? I can obviously only speak for myself, but like I, I personally, like part of being invited, it's nice, the comfort of being invited, right? But I mentioned before, I, I would love to have to qualify as well, because it automatically gives you a lot of preparation in a real setting, right? Mm -hmm. I now that I don't have to play qualifiers, I'm probably not gonna like intensify my preparation until like it's getting closer. Um, I might be around to help. It's now doubt has to qualify, right? Uh, <laughs> I might, I'll be around to help him, of course. But like it's, it's still not the same. I would, I would, I think I would benefit from having to qualify if that makes sense. Uh, I'm not sure if the others feel the same way, but because like I still feel confident enough that I would qualify if I had to play qualifiers. So to be forced to go through the preparation there in advance would be nice. But then again, also being invited, I can just sit back and watch everyone, uh, how they do things. And I can take some ideas here and there. And uh, I can prepare without showing anything that I want to show. Hmm. So it's like, there, there's pros and cons to everything. But also it's like, as a competitive player, I want to play competitive matches. And right. when there's suddenly like a month of qualifiers, like that's a month where I'm not playing competitive <laughs> matches. Which is invited. Much, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like with everything, it's the positives and negatives. I think it requires a healthy dose of discipline to say, okay, even though I don't have to qualify, I still mm. should be practicing, you know? And That's where it helps to have doubt, because he always has to qualify. <laughs> Yet another bird. Doubt keeps getting <laughs> big over here. Yeah, so uh, I actually think that makes total sense, because, I mean, if you don't have to qualify, you don't have to play. You know we should be playing, but you're yeah. not playing. You're not testing the maps as hard. So who do you think is going to be your main training partner? Is it going to be Doubt? Is it going to be Hera? Probably, like... Um... Sumero, Valas. Uh, I, I feel like I feel like there's a joke here, but I I'm not getting it. <laughs> no, uh, the joke is that I'm gonna mostly be playing Red Forest. Uh, but, uh, uh, right, right, right. I get it now. So yeah, as I just said, <laughs> in case you guys didn't notice, Doubt, Doubt is has to qualify. Oh. Is the only one for oh. the game religion players that has to qualify. So how confident are you that he's gonna make it? He should make it. He's he's playing well. Like he's delivering really solid games overall. He but just beat MBL rather easily, right? I saw him like a show MBL match two days ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, wait, what was the score? Like it was a Warlord show match, right? Yeah, and he was so leading was... three one. I gotta confess, I didn't see it until the end, but he was leading three one. So I just assumed uh, he was going to finish somewhere around those lines. But anyway, yeah, uh, I, I think he's gonna make it too. I was just uh, wondering if you're. I was trying to give you the chance to burn him one more time. I'm just trying to figure out. Ah, oh, damn it, he won. Okay, he did uh, win. Doubt won five five two in the end. Five, yeah, okay. but yeah, like I said, doubt overall, despite all memes and jokes, he's delivering really high results. I would say the last year, year and a half, cool. like he was very inconsistent. I would say over. Let's say the last four four years, like even during Red Bull Three, right? It was just like a, it was uh, it was not there. The what's it called? It was not a consistent performance. He was not expected to be winning Red Bull, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, he has it in his locker to do that, and uh, he will definitely qualify. What has changed there for him? Do you know? I think it's a mindset thing. He just like took the pressure off himself. He realizes that he's a good player. He doesn't have to win, and he doesn't have to get top four. He doesn't have to get top eight. He knows that uh, top sixteen sometimes. But like, yeah, it's just when you when you can flip a switch in your brain, sometimes to it will like alleviate a lot of the pressure that you might feel, and you suddenly like just like it frees up your gameplay, and also doubt learn to use the market. So <laughs> it's kind of crazy to me how much mental, how much of the mentality of a player makes a difference in Age of Empires mm -hmm. Two. And I say this because it's something that everybody mentions, so it's got to be true. Is Jordan gonna sign up? I would not expect so. No. Oh, seriously? Why not? Uh, it's, it's, uh, he's heading different ways in life right now. 
Okay, that's sad. I was was still gonna hope that we would sign up. Okay. I mean, I, I can't speak for him, right? I haven't talked to him about it specifically, but okay. I would be surprised to see him sign up. Okay, but he had such a good result in NAC. And Hidden um, Cup, top top eight in Hidden Cup without training yeah, a single match. I wanted, I wanted to say <laughs> Hidden Cup. Okay, that's yeah. sad. Well, I guess. If you haven't said anything further, you're not going to say I, anything further. I, I can't say. Like, I haven't st- talked with him specifically about, hey, are you going to play Warlords or anything, right? Okay, uh, but has something happened that would lead you to think that he's not going to sign up? I mean, how much Age of Empires have you seen him play since NAC or Hidden Well, Cup? again, I haven't seen before that, and he still signed up for both NAC and Hidden Cup. So but Hidden Cup, he was invited, so it's like, why would he turn it down? Okay, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> then we have a nine villager start. We talked about this. Is it actually the same nine villager start than NAC five? But it, this is so confusing to me because it, because they have like the NAC five start. They have the Deep Waters League yeah. nine villager start. I mean, the Deep Waters League was the origination of the nine villager start, right? Where they right, did the calculations right. for like, okay, how many resources would we have roughly at this point with this civilization? So they adjusted Chinese, Mayans, and every civ according to like what would the situation look like on paper with a standard opening. And then warlords came and they just like, everyone gets the normal resources, if I remember correctly. So it was like, that was like a shift again, right? Where it also sped up the game in some ways and made the better civs maybe even better on warlords because they didn't have that balance, right? Um, and then NEC, I'm not sure. I don't remember exactly how NEC has done it. What they try to do is they try to mimic the exact state of, state of the game whenever you have the same amount of villagers that you start with. Yeah, so they okay. went for the Deep Waters League uh, approach Absolutely. in that yes. case. Yeah. Yes. So that's NEC then. Uh, so yeah, that's that's a different uh, difference then, right? I'm not sure what Warlords will use this time, but if I recall correctly, the last time Warlords just had like everyone has the standard resources from the start. Right. No correction. Yeah. Is yeah. it confusing for players? Does it make practicing a little bit difficult? Not really, as long as there's a gap between, right? Um, you, you will uh, get the feel know. for it very quickly once you start playing the the maps. Okay. Uh, okay. So I, I was just thinking the other day. We know the three big tournament organizers in our scene, so that would be Nilly, Mem, T90. They mm-hmm. all get $100,000 each per fiscal year to organize tournaments. This year, for example, Nilly used that money for NAC5. Tristan used it for, uh, I want to say, Triton's League. <laughs> Titan tr- League. Tritons. Tri- Tristan, Triton's League. Titan's League and Hidden Cup 5. And Mem used it for both Warlords. So that would be Warlords 2 and now 3. Now, well, the fiscal year, fiscal year, first of all, goes from... It's June, right? June it's to June, I think. June to yeah. June, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so. So if Mem ever decides for himself, he doesn't want to organize Battle of Africa anymore, he doesn't want to organize King of the Desert anymore, do you think, would it make sense for him to use the whole 100,000 bucks to just make one tournament and just make it bigger? Maybe with the extra funds, he can even like make a land for four players or something. Would it be worth it for him, you think? That's with the... I mean, I don't think... That he will be allowed to be like, hey, Microsoft, okay, I know you might give me $100,000. I'm just going to take that all for one tournament. Microsoft be like, might be like, hmm, really? can't you rather do two tournaments? You know, I mean, they need still want to fill up the calendar, right? So there's enough tournaments throughout the year, right? If suddenly Mem, T90, whoever gets a fund from Microsoft decides, okay, I'm only going to do one event. Suddenly the calendar is like, okay, suddenly there's three months until the next event. That's like, that's a lot of dead time, right? So you think for them it's important that there's constantly tournaments coming? I think for Microsoft it makes sense that they want to have activity, right? It, hmm. What game ever thrives under inactivity, right? Right, because well, a lot of people have been complaining that we have too many S-tier tournaments and they want to see fewer S-tier tournaments with more, with bigger, grander, I don't know if prize pools, but you know, with a grander feeling for the tournament. Yeah. No, I think the balance right now is very nice, right? I felt like between NAC and Hidden Cup, there was a nice break. And I feel like now between Hidden Cup and Warlords, there's also been a nice break from like S-tier. Um, we still have plenty of smaller tournaments for those who want to still play tournaments, right? Rage 4 is other only one tournaments. We had the death, sudden death tournament now. We had the Thalassocracy Cup. There's some show matches here and there. No, I feel like I feel like the balance is pretty good right now. The issue was only like I think towards the end of the last year, we had like I don't remember. Was it Warlords 2? Warlords 2. Oh, we had, it was November. November, yeah. Yeah. And I had the um, my tournament as well. I don't remember anymore. Cartographers, Cartographers. right <laughs> after. Like it was just like a there was like very quick succession. Um and then NEC5. NEC5. Yeah, I feel like uh now the break from NEC5 to Hidden Cup and then here has been very nice. And I would like this rhythm to stay, so to say. And of course, I don't know how Microsoft also operates, right? Do they just give, say, okay, you have 100K, do whatever you want. I don't know if that's necessarily the case or if they get some guy. I mean, the way I know it, you have to apply still. Hey, I want to host this tournament. Right. How much can I get for it? Right. Hmm. 
but that's we know I, I mean this is i don't think this is official information but you can see you can see it i mean if you just add up the prize pools this is a fact i mean these guys are getting 100k per year but let's imagine microsoft does not say they want you to organize several tournaments instead it's just one mm -hmm. from a pure like um channel growth perspective what do you think is actually better for you as a content creator to just have like two smaller tournaments or one big ass one well the, the issue is when you say smaller it's still not small right yeah, exactly. absolutely uh smaller with yeah, big, smaller. big quotation marks yeah, very yeah. big quotation marks <laughs> I, I would still say two smaller ones are better because you have okay. like you have two big surges of jumps instead of just like one big one right and even like one single 100k tournament is not necessarily guaranteed let me first of all let's say you get 100k not, everything is not going to the price pool. You're not going to advertise the tournament as a $100,000 price pool, right? Because you want to have production, you want to pay your admins, you want to pay graphics. Like A lot of the money goes to behind-the-scenes stuff, right? Depending mm -hmm. on how much effort you want to put around that, right? Like when I did Cartographers, for example, I was just like, we're going to put everything into the price pool and we'll figure it out somehow, right? <laughs> but that's like, also, I only, only, also in quotation marks, I only got uh, $15,000 for that one, right? Mm -hmm. And then I was able to... Uh, bargain on top of that a little bit extra to pay the admins um but if you want to have a big production like we have had from mem with uh, his tournaments where he has like a uh what's it called essentially you have like an observer you have the, a program oh, and yeah, yeah production team production yeah, yeah exactly yeah. which uh, mem has had now we have had t90 had it with hidden cup and nearly obviously has with ac a lot of the funds go there if you're like absolutely if you want that so like there's the balance there as well mm -hmm. i i still think Two big tournaments is better than one large tournament, if that makes sense. Okay. If, if it's better for, for channel, channel growth and yeah, also I think for the so. community. Also for the community, I assume. Yeah. Also for players, you get more chances. I think more chances right. on like large prize pools is better than one massive chance. I mean, do you, do you know the StarCraft 2 tournament they had? It was like a winner's take all tournament. Of, winner's take all? No. I don't even remember the prize pool, but it was like a massive prize pool. And it was the, only the winner gets prize money. It's crazy. Crazy. And Nearly okay. had like a dream of doing that in Age of Empires, <laughs> where he wanted to do like $100,000 and winner takes everything. And it's like, it's crazy for the hype and the spark around it. But like, right. imagine getting second place. Like, yeah, that's so, good. It's so frustrating. Yeah, I get it. Uh, it's important to note that Microsoft doesn't just give money like that. Obviously, they set some goals for the organizers yeah. in terms of viewership. I think hours watched. It's something you've told me. It's a big thing for them, right? Hours they... watched is important. And like, like I said, I don't. It's not like Microsoft set, tells you, "Oh, yeah, we want to reach this. And we want to reach that." It's more like you present your project to Microsoft, and they'll look at it and be like, "Okay, okay, mm, okay, we can do this and this, right?" And then maybe they'll give you some pointers like we would like this and we would like that, or maybe they, they wanna do. maybe they wanna like synchronize it with some release of a DLC or like a sale or something like that, right? So right. sometimes there are where they will like get involved a little bit, but they never touch like tournament settings or anything like that. So um, I think Microsoft praise where praise is uh, deserved. They do a very good job of letting the creators hands off. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hands off approach. I like it. Now, what I do know uh, is that someone with a large audience such as yourself would most likely be able to meet these high requirements for viewership if you ever wanted to. So I was wondering, have you ever considered organizing a large scale event yourself? I know it's a lot of work and you've done it, uh, but it seems to me like this is like one of the most effective and surest ways of actually growing your channel. I mean, you look at T90 after a Hidden Cup 4, uh, mm -hmm. 5, or you look at Nilly after an NAC, and their sub counts basically double or triple. I know it's a lot of work and it's easier said than done, but I assume, pretty sure, you would be able to hit the marks that it's needed for like a big prize pool for Microsoft. Have you ever considered that? I mean, I, I have done my a few events, but they're obviously smaller. Right. Uh, like the Open Classic, the Cartographers. Um, I the, the the weird part here is like while it sounds on paper great and like it's something I could probably do, I'm still a player here, right? I'm not. It, it feels weird for me to host like oh yeah, fifty thousand uh, dollar Viking warriors, whatever, right? And then like, oh the winner is the Viper, you know? Like I'm the host and the player. It, That's very I mean, optimistic, bro. That's I very optimistic. Just just an example, right? <laughs> I mean, we, me and Jordan did win the cartographers, right? Which I hosted. Even that feels a bit strange, but. I think I'm not in a place where it's like, as long as I'm like actively competing in one of the top competitors, I don't feel like it's my place to host large events. 
What about just delegating all of it? I know, again, more funds means maybe a smaller prize pool. Because I'm just thinking from the pure perspective of a content creator. I mean, it doesn't matter how big your channel is. It's just going to grow so much bigger. It seems to be the one thing that really works every time to work one's channel, to yeah, grow one's channel. That's also where it's like, I mean, look at the cryptographers. I did delegate a lot, right? I had the initial weeks leading up to the announcement where I was very heavily involved, right? In all the settings, format, this and that, right? But I said, as soon as the tournament is announced and begins, I am done. I am just a player, right? All the power was then pushed to my admins, right? Which is, I think that would be the way I should host tournaments. Right. Uh, what about something like that for a one v one tournament with a yeah. $50,000 prize pool? It still feels weird to me. And it's like, also like I'm, I won't, I think to have growth, you need to also demand some exclusivity in some regards, right? Ooh. Not, not demand exclusivity in that regard. Wait, wait, like, wait. We're getting to controversial territory. Listen oh, no. to this guy. Like, <laughs> I don't, like, I've, my channel is doing fine, right? I have no need to, like, further extend my... Uh, like, I, I, if I was a smaller creator, I would definitely, like, if I was to a tournament, I would. No hesitation. But I would. And you some... wouldn't get the money, but then you wouldn't get as much money because you're smaller. You'd have a large enough audience. No, know? no. But I would like force everyone to have like my name in the title or my logo, this and that, right? When mm -hmm. I host my events right now, it's just like, guys, go out there, make the best show you can for yourself and your stream and the tournament. Bring in as many viewers as you can. Spread the word of Age of Empires, right? Oh, that's what you mean. And okay. Yeah, I, like I, I, because uh, I'm at the position I am, and I don't need to do anything else than that, right? So I, I feel like that's my way of contributing at the moment with tournaments. It's like, I'll get some money from Microsoft and I'm able to do that just, okay, I'm gonna put up a good format, good fun settings, and everyone just go out there and make the best show out of this that you can. Because I feel like when you have the freedom to do your own thing on your own channel, that's gonna be way better for you yourself and your viewers as well. And in turn, you know, like the rising tides lift the whole thing, right? Here we go, thing, here right? we go. <laughs> uh, but like, obviously, obviously if I had like a $100,000 tournament, I would also maybe be a bit different about it, like, okay, I want to bring more eyes to my channel since I'm hosting a $100,000 tournament, right? Right. Um, yeah, I think you should consider and consider that at some point. Um, not if just I, maybe when I'm just, washed. <laughs> Proper washed. It doesn't even have to be that. Just imagine right now. Well, if it's true that Neely is really not going to organize anything anymore, we suddenly have $100,000 that are not going to be in the scene anymore, right? So NAC is gone. Is that how it works, so, though? That there is like no. a I don't think so. Of course, the Microsoft gives money. I mean, Microsoft has a lot of money. So if somebody sort of fulfills the requirements and the criteria that they put for people to get the money, they just give it. That's what I assume is happening. And I'm again, I'm pretty sure you would be able to fulfill those criteria. I mean, I've already approached them and I've applied and asked to host cartographers too, right? If they come back to me like, oh yeah, we want, would love for you to do this, then I can ask and inquire like, okay, so... Not that Neely is not here anymore. Uh, <laughs> how much are we talking? You know, I, I can always play around with that idea, but okay, um, we'll see. I, I, yeah, I haven't we'll really see. like. I, I understand where you're coming from with these thoughts, and I'll keep it in mind. But again, like I still feel like as long as I'm one of the top competitors, especially in the one-on-one, -one, I feel a bit off by hosting like one-on-one, -one and then I'd be like, price is only for top two, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we wouldn't have to do that. There's but always I don't, conflict of interest, essentially. I don't think those things would be mutually exclusive. If you make it very clearly, I'm not admitting this tournament, somebody else, I think it's perfectly fine. But yeah, I totally get it as well. Uh, moving on, my friends. Uh, so I think it was precisely one day after we recorded our episode with Doubt that it was announced the AM team was disbanding. And I believe, Orion, the official explanation, I believe, was that they didn't want to give the idea that AM was a sponsored team, you know, by playing under the same tag, uh, because that could potentially sort of scare away some actual sponsors, which I think makes perfect sense. And I also guess this makes it a little bit easier for them as individuals to find sponsors or to find a team. Because, I mean, if it's already difficult to find a sponsor for one player, finding a sponsor for four players, mm -hmm. it's basically impossible. Now, when I heard they were disbanding, in my mind, I was like, okay, so one of them is going to join a real esports organization, for sure. Because, I mean, if it's just a group of friends anyway, what's the point of disbanding, right? That's mm -hmm. what I was thinking. It's not like suddenly they're not friends anymore. And I'm happy to report that it looks like I was right. So my sources Ooh. tell me that some of the former AM players might have found an organization that will support them. I don't know which players, though I can imagine. <laughs> I don't know which team. I actually don't even know if it's a team that is already on the scene or a completely new one. I don't know. Now, now that I think of it, might as well be Gamer Legion. I don't know. <laughs> in, any, in any case, I think this is great news. <laughs> That's uh, exciting, yeah. Yeah, I think this is great news, yeah. So so how did you read the whole situation? Um, 
did you uh do you know anything about this by the way uh, I've heard nothing about this, no. Uh, okay. So I have no idea. Um, I don't know how you have your little spice everywhere in every yeah, corner. Yeah, spice of... everywhere. I heard in <laughs> two weeks. I don't know if that timeline sort okay. of fits. And I heard it's not confirmed, but it's looking looking good. That's okay. what I heard. Um, no, obviously, Hero joining GL. It's like, I mean, even though, how to say, AM was originating as a group of friends from the top, top players, right? I wouldn't know. I don't know if like was Nico, was MBL really close friends? Like I know Hart and Leary played a ton of Rage Black Forest back Black in the Forest past, right? Together. Yeah. So they yeah. obviously were like very familiar with each other early on. And then I would say Hera joined and blend very well with them, even though Hera was the last member to join AM. Hmm. I'm not sure how close they were, like in a friendship level with Nico and with MBL, right? I honestly have no idea. Um it could also be that they were just they got along very well and they became close to friends as they teamed up, but they didn't maybe team up as a group of friends they teamed up as okay we guys get along and we ha can have a great team that may have been the origination of am right for all we know uh but yeah obviously Hera was the main guy that was trying to get sponsorships for the team he was the most active streamer most active everywhere pretty much with am so when he left i don't think am really had any good chances of becoming sponsored as a team right so yeah when they now separate there is the chance for like you them to like suddenly maybe i mean like we see mine sandy right we have um what's the other fox fox fox, fox and mine yeah. sandy right we see that they are showing incentive to become good and be an up-and-comer right and maybe the am guys won't have a chance maybe maybe that's one of the teams you're talking about and yeah dude now that you're talking about this i just remembered i saw one tweet from fox because someone was saying okay somebody please pick up or i guess they were addressing fox directly actually mm -hmm. fox please pick up nikov must have been right. an Argentinian fan. Uh, and uh, Fox replied, unfortunately, we already signed a new, very promising talent. Oh. They said something like this. I mean, it okay. could not be connected, could maybe not be related, but it would be very a big coincidence if it wasn't. So maybe one of them is joining Fox. I don't know. But we but also have the, uh, was it the co Combi? The one Kingston? Combi team, yeah. true. I don't know how much they support players, though. I, I know very little about them. I believe the, there's a decent solid community down there and they're even like doing lawn things combi too okay yeah i know i've been invited to one. Oh, amazing in mexico or i don't know no, I, I don't remember the location uh i don't know how much of this is public either i think <laughs> they already did one hmm. and they want to do another one uh but yeah, i don't want to have you there that's amazing <laughs> no, but i don't think like the I, mean, I think they've done one but i, I don't didn't see the word spread on social media and such so i cannot say for sure mm -hmm. but um maybe that's a team for like South American Nico, for example, right? Maybe they'll have interest in him. Uh, I don't know. But yeah, we have a couple of teams around that probably will be interested in picking. I mean, like, who doesn't want to pick up Leary, right? If he's, like, not too expensive and, like, just yeah. to have him represent them. Um, no, I think overall it's good for the individuals of AM, right? question is just, okay, how does this impact the team game scene? In my opinion, this could be great for the team game scene as well because suddenly we have, like, the mind of Nico entering a team, the mind of... Um, I almost said MBL, but <laughs> uh, the mind of a heart and like yeah, and the Leary. hands of a Leary, the hands of a Leary, right? Yeah, so, like suddenly they are entering a team, and like maybe there was one team that was just missing an extra piece to like suddenly take the next step, and suddenly like okay, then we have three more teams that are competitive rather than just AM, which is like ultra competitive. So, right, right. Let's wait to see what the announcements are, but I'm very excited for it because I guess we've said this many times here as well. A little financial help, it doesn't have to be big, but it sometimes goes a long way in sort of helping you justify for yourself and like for your family yep. and friends. Hey, this is why I'm committing so much time mm -hmm. for Age of Empires too, right? I think that's a big help. I mean, that was for me, just quickly on that, like for yeah, me yeah, when sure. I was younger, like there was way letter, less money in Age of Empires back then, right? But as I started winning just a few hundred dollars here and there, that was like big help for me to start, okay, I should maybe like play this a bit more, you know? And Tyrant came on board and like suddenly there was like, we got a little bit of salary from Tyrant. It was like, hmm. damn, this is worth pursuing, right? So yeah, just any small amount, if any teams want to pick up players and give them an incentive to train and carry on with their careers, we're encouraging it. <laughs> Absolutely. And I also think this is very important, especially in a year, you know, to have more players joining teams, especially in a year where we'll have another Red Bull tournament. Mm -hmm. Because uh, something else my sources tell me is that Red Bull right now is actually the only tournament that reaches audiences outside of Age of Empires. 
apparently tournaments like Hidden Cup or NAC, these things are mostly watched by people who already follow the game and are already following the content creators themselves. But Red Bull seems to be the only one that's able to actually go beyond that. So, you know, if you have a Red Bull tournament now and you see players from several teams, you see content being made from like several different organizations. I think this gives a lot of legitimacy to the scene. That, that's yeah. my hope, at least. I think so, that makes a lot of sense, yeah. I mean, I, I think Hidden Cup also is like one of those tournaments that have potential to reach outside of Age of Empires familiarity. Uh, but yeah, Red Bull, obviously, with their brand and their global marketing, whatnot, uh, they will spread their wings, as they say. And, and I think it's especially because they also organize other games, right? So you have them organizing a lot of different games. And mm -hmm. so a lot of the people that might follow the channel see, oh, hey, Age of Empires 2. Yeah. I used to play this when I was young, right? And so they might get to know the game. Like and that. their social media obviously has a massive reach from like, massive you know, Age of Empires accounts. fans. Yeah, they yeah, do yeah, post yeah. things on Rebel Gaming, for example, on their website and so forth. Yeah, yeah. So I'm really hoping I'm, we have surprisingly little information so far, uh, unfortunately, on Red Bull. I'm hoping we're going to get something very soon. El Reynado. El Reynado. It's the only thing we know. Uh, so, yeah, well, what I also wanted to say is, though, is that players do need to do their part, though. I, I think this is an yeah. important point. Again, I don't think that just being good at the game, while incredibly hard for sure to be good at this incredibly hard game, I don't think that alone creates enough value for teams. So I, I really would hope we'd see more creative content from players, more well-produced content, stuff like that. Okay, so let's move on. We also had a new PUP in April that brings a few buffs to Scorpions and then the balance changes. But the big headlines here are two, I'll do everything. Uh, two controversial new features. We have auto farm placement and an auto scouting feature for all scouts mm. and not just the initial one. So let's start with the first one, the auto farm placement. First of all, uh, this is what has been spotted so far. Maybe there's more. Um, there are some patch notes now, though. Ah, they okay, did release okay. some patch notes, and they only mentioned these two things, so I'm okay. hoping there's nothing else that's hidden there. So, yeah, so to those of you familiar with Age of Empires 4, I believe this works in a similar way, right? So I think you just select, like, a farm, and you shift-click on a mill, and then, like, your cursor just automatically moves to the right spots. Is that how it works? Uh, the cursor doesn't move, but the farm placement moves to the next available spot, essentially. All right, so what's Around your Around where your cursor is. Mm-hmm. Uh, What's well, the take, actually, opinion like, on that? Initially, when I saw it, I was like, okay, they're adding another feature to make the game easier, which has been the... It has been what's been happening the last couple of years, right? With the They try to make the game more easily accessible and easier to pull off for, I would say, newer people, right? Um, for me, it's like these types of quality of life features, I have no issues with whatsoever. It's the same like multi queue, right? It's just going to allow me to spend more time on things that should matter in the game, in my opinion. Slapping down eight farms fast is like, why should that be like a, I mean, a crucial skill in Asian Yeah, what Empires? separates you from a good player? Yeah, right? that should not be like how fast you plays farms. Um, I don't understand though why people feel like the game has already been dumbed down so much already. Uh, it is a 20-year-old game. People wanted to have the hardcore feel that games used to have in the past, but that's not the day and age we live in, right? People wanted to be able to jump in and play a game and feel like it's not, you're not fighting the game, you're just playing the game. I remember when I started trying Warcraft 3, for example, right? Also a very old game. Sometimes I felt like I was playing, trying to just fight against the AI of the game rather than playing and enjoying the game. Um, obviously, that's not necessarily correlated uh, related to the farming here, but I think it's fine. I don't see an issue with it. And I think people complaining about it is like, how is this going to impact? Is this not going to change the level at your level that you're playing at? It's not going to make you or your opponents play worse or better. It's just a small, <laughs> nice feature to help placing farms more conveniently. And I've also seen some clips where, or pictures where it shows like the farm placement isn't perfect. It will sometimes act very, like a little bit. No, you might have gaps. seen that Reddit post. I was confused yeah. by it as well. I was confused by it. If I understood that post correctly, it was very weirdly worded in my opinion, but I think that was a suggestion from the guy that if you use the auto farm oh. placement, it shouldn't be perfect. Oh. I believe that was the implication. I think the farm placement is sort of ideal. I, I, ah, I think okay. I, I might have I might have misunderstood it. I the wording it was. was very confusing in that post. I, I thought it was uh, like a showcase of how it can yeah, come I, out. I think, I think it was a suggestion from the guy. Okay. I, I guess so we're going to have confirmation no. of that in a few. Who cares uh, <laughs> if its farms are perfect or not? It, who, it's such a small yeah. thing. <laughs> I yeah I, I I'm I'm right with you there actually I do understand the auto fe auto everything fears, but uh, yeah I suspect this change will have a very very minor effect because you don't actually zero. save uh, zero <laughs> you don't actually save any clicks right I mean you do save a few mouse movements yeah 
That's true. But in so, like shift queuing tasks, for example, where you don't even have to look at the screen anymore, that does save you a lot of mouse movement and screen movements. Where you might save clicks is you avoid misclicks, right? Sometimes you try yes. to place farms and it's like, oh, you clicked it on top of an already built farm or like the corner of a built farm. So there is the, the thing that you save because you want misclick or hit. When you're trying to spam farms quickly in Imperial Age, for example, you're not going to misclick and like waste two, three clicks, right? So mm -hmm. that's the only thing. But like, again, who cares? <laughs> you know, the biggest benefit, I believe, of this feature is that they're going to be bases are going to look prettier. <laughs> I think that's probably going to be the biggest, <laughs> uh, biggest benefit that we have. Actually, the most common critique, because I think this hasn't been received too poorly in the community, as far mm -hmm. as I was able to see. I think the most common critique that I've read about this change was that folks were saying stuff like, I'd prefer they fix the game first before they right. add new features. I've seen a lot of that. But I'm pretty sure these things are not mutually exclusive. I believe you can have them fixed whenever it to be fixed mm -hmm. and work on new future at the same time. Yeah, a lot of people seem to be set on this idea that devs are incredibly incompetent. And, you know, I guess that's certainly a possibility. I'm not denying it. But personally, I think it's a lot more likely the case that um, from what I heard from a lot of people that do work in the industry, it's just incredibly hard to work yeah. on the base code of this game. It just seems to be very complicated uh, to work with. Very I old mean, coding. Yeah, I mean, they add a drop-off button and suddenly you have villagers hunting trees with yeah. bows and arrows. <laughs> if that doesn't show you what a nightmare it must be to work on this game, uh, I don't know what will. I think there was, wasn't there a story where they touched something in the scenario editor and something broke, a completely other part of the game broke. Like they changed a small thing in the scenario editor and like something else completely broke. Like the way the code is put together, like imagine they just rebuilt Age of Empires in a modern engine exactly how it is, just with their code. That would be, I'm not sure how long that would take. <laughs> probably but long, probably, probably a long time, but like <laughs> at this point, maybe it would have been worth it, you know? Uh, no, but like it's also like there are, there are different departments, right? Like the, whoever is working on new features might not have anything to do with bug fixing and such, right? So that's you shouldn't right. put those guys and just be like, hey, stop working until we fix this, right? They should <laughs> right, still right, do right. things. That's what I think. That's what I think. It's probably yeah. happened. And another thing I want to add is that regardless of how incompetent you think these devs might be, I suspect, and I'd actually like to hear the opinions of folks in the comment section who know more about this than me, but I suspect these devs are still going to be, by far, I assume, the most competent devs on the markets to work on this specific yes. code. You know, simply by virtue of the fact they've been working on it for like, what is it, 12 years now? I guess 11 years. I believe they became part of the project in 2013. So yeah, uh, be, be careful what we wish for, man. <laughs> Look at what they did with HD Edition, right? They brought in a, another an external company Skylab start, or whatever. Yeah, something like that to try and work on the game. It was an absolute disaster, right? <laughs> like, very fair point. Very fair point. And they're like, they were probably like competent developers. Right, right. right. But they were not, none of them probably learned coding with whatever was used back in the days in 1999 or whatever. Um, I think we should be very happy with like the love and attention the game is getting. Agreed. Of course, bugs and issues are frustrating always, no matter what. But and criticism is rightfully due very often, but at the same time, we have to also be a little bit understanding of the situation we're in. And like, it, it's not like they have a team of uh, thousands of people working on the game. They're either, a small right? studio. Yeah, yeah they're exactly. getting bigger, but they're a small studio. Yeah. Uh, I think Q and A testing needs to improve. That one hundred percent yeah. the case. One hundred. I don't need what they need to do there. It needs to to increase because I mean, a we lot of bugs. Yeah, we have suggested in the past, like just pick eight, ten pros or like people at high level. Just pay them a little bit of money and they grind, uh, like spend one evening play for a couple hours. I, yeah, I guess you, the just pay a little bit of money might be doing a heavy lifting there. Might be, yeah, of course. But <laughs> I that's assume, the I they wouldn't need a lot, right? I'm sure a lot of people do it for like 20, 30 bucks. Just play an evening of Age of Empires, right? <laughs> you want to do that anyway. <laughs> uh, and then it's like, you would find so many, so many of these bugs that we have noticed after release. I feel like I would have figured them out within two or three games. Hmm. A lot of them would have come up naturally, right? Yeah, that's what a lot of people say. True. Now, as for the out of scouting with all scouts, man, mm -hmm. I think that one does cross a line for me. I, I guess I'd need to see it in action first and see what kind of abuse pro players can do with it. But I think it sounds bad. Now, to be clear, it is my understanding that auto scouts only explore unexplored areas. And, you know, yeah. as soon as the map ex is explored, they just go idle. Uh, so yeah. you can't really look for sneaks or anything like that. But I just think whenever you're playing a map with a very sort of unclear layout, let's say 
Nomad or maybe some Mega Random or some brand new map that nobody knows about. Mm -hmm. This does feel to me like it removes an incredibly important aspect of the skill set of a player because, you know, it can just create a scout going to Feudal, one going up to Castle H, put an auto scout and that's it. Uh, so, yeah, how, how do you see this one? Well, uh, this feature is not, it's not like I'm not going to be actively using it, right? Maybe if I have leftover scouts, that's the only case, right? Oh, dude, dude, I've heard you're one of the most, one, one of the pros that uses auto scouting the most. That's what someone said on Reddit. And Compared it, to maybe the other pros, because I click it. If maybe. it's on Reddit, if it's on Reddit, it's <laughs> going to be true, you know? Yeah. No, I mean, like, I, I maybe I misclick it sometimes. I used to misclick, I used to have a hotkey for it, right? So I, I tend to misclick it sometimes. I don't have a hotkey for it anymore. So, <laughs> um, no, but like, I, I can see myself using it with leftover scouts from Fuelish just to complete figure, the map, right? Hmm. But, even then, like there will be, if there's black spots in the enemy base, sometimes your scout will just try to get there and you will just die, right? So there, there are pros and cons to like using it as well. I think pro players rarely will use it. You think so? What about in a map like Nomad? You're going up to Castle Age, you don't have much to do, you don't even know where your enemy is, maybe, and you just I'm put it on out of scouts on Nomad, right? Maybe one player out of eight has a scout on Nomad. Well, would it be worth it to make one to scout the map? Build a stable just to build a scout. I, I wouldn't do it if I didn't have a stable to begin with, right? Okay. I mean, I can see it like on lower level. Obviously, a lot of people will use it because it's just like, why not? And your, your attention is spent elsewhere, right? But where at the higher levels where you have the APM to scout manually yourself if you want to, I don't see why I would use auto scout over manual scouting, right? You sure? I, I don't think it's a game changer, essentially. Okay. Yeah, but you're sure you're in Castle Age. There, there's fighting happening everywhere. We have three TCs. Isn't it so easy to just put one scout on auto scout and it's just going to have it's the map revealed food, to you? 80 foot. All right. <laughs> I mean, if you say so, if you say so, I'm gonna believe you. No, I mean, uh, like, like I said, I if I have leftover scouts from Fuel Edge, I would just pull one or two of them to the side and like have them auto scout from that point forward. Okay, isn't that a bit broken? No, the the, the logic. If, if they fix the logic in the auto scout, sure, you can have a scout run across the map like through for one minute in uh, scouted terrain just to pick up one dark spot that is randomly in the middle of your base, right? It's like the auto scouting logic isn't necessarily great. And I think if you have two units on auto scout, they're going to follow the same pattern as well. Mm -hmm. Like at most, you're using one scout to auto scout, most likely, no matter what. Um, okay, so no big deal in your opinion. And as I said as well, like if there are black spots behind your enemy base, your scout might just make a line straight through the enemy base, and he will just die. <laughs> I, I don't think it's going to be a game changer. No, not a big deal in my opinion. Okay. Okay. I'll be waiting to see if that's the case. Uh, I hear this is apparently going to be an amazing change for campaigns because sometimes mm, I think it can get true. really tedious to look like for certain characters that you need yeah. to find and if they're hidden somewhere. But yeah. Okay. And uh, just uh, to make it clear, uh, this is only a PUP, so we don't even know for sure if they're actually going to bring it into the live patch. Okay, Viper, so you still wanted to talk about the Sod Disaster. So, yeah, how did you feel about that tournament? Uh, it looked really fun to me, at least, from the outside. Sun Disaster has been one of the most thing, fun things I've played. I mean, I went out fairly early. I think I played two or three rounds. I uh, lost to Taro. Uh, but, yeah, the, the amount of crazy YOLO plays you can make in Sudden Death, where it's like you lose your town center and you're defeated, essentially. The amount of crazy strategies, castle drops. and like, The only negative thing was probably like it encourages too much of the, like, Fast aim trap meta to try and trap down <laughs> the town center, but the amount of petard plays we've seen and like crazy YOLO pushes. What about for you? That was so fun in the hideout game. That was so yeah, fun. Yeah. <laughs> the, it's just been so much fun and like, and there's been like a talking point here as well, right? People have fun with this because it's not as serious, right? And the price right. isn't as big, right? So what happens if suddenly sudden disaster, which in my opinion was a great success, Microsoft comes in, okay, you want to give this ten thousand dollars. Is that going to remove the fun that is sudden disaster? I feel like it probably will, right? Yeah, because suddenly people start preparing strategies. Like right. I think, like I don't think anyone was, I don't think anyone <laughs> prepared and thought about like, okay how they want to play this. Oh, I should prioritize this save and this save, right? I think everyone just yoloed it, and that made it so much fun as well. And I would love to see more events like this. You can have like a decent price pool to the point where people want to play it. But also not enough where it's like you have to find a balance where it's not. I'm not going to be super sad if I'm eliminated right i want to have i would like to have fun right and like i said the tournament for me was one of the most fun tournaments in a long time and massive shout out to john slow for for putting it up and again for having the guts to try something new i think that's yeah. a very important point i love that people keep trying new things i think in general when you have a mode that reduces like the amount of strategies that it can do and reduces one very big part of age of empires 2 
is probably going to be as not going to be as well received as if you make it like an S tier tournament or something like that. I feel like folks yeah. are going to think this removes too much of what makes Age of Empires so fun. It's too gimmicky, yeah. Yeah. And uh, speaking of that, Peter, I thought he was so funny. The final was amazing, by the way. It was Mr. Yo against Winchester. And it was that game on Hideout as well, where everybody thought that one of the guys, because Yo, I believe, was playing as Kumer. Mm -hmm. And everybody was saying that Yo is probably going to try the same thing that you tried against yeah. this guy, I believe it was. And yeah. then he went from the side and completely debated Venchester. That was such an amazing moment. So he cut not from the middle, but from the side. And Siska and Vigil was not expecting it at all. Ah. And uh, Yo won like that because he just did, <laughs> did not cut in the middle where yeah. people were expecting him to. Such an amazing moment. And then the arena game okay. was amazing as well. I think people should check that out. Okay, then I still want to talk about the World Rumble 2. So for those of you who can't wait until the start of the World Lords 3 qualifiers, you can watch right now very high-level games in the World Rumble 2. This is a tournament organized by the French streamer OGN, and it has a nice and funny prize pool of $11,111, <laughs> sponsored by Microsoft and Holy. Holy is apparently one of the only sponsors that has actually come back to the scene because they sponsored one of the Gamer Legion's tournaments mm -hmm. in the past, I remember. And I believe Microsoft did sponsor $10,000, so Holy gave no math on stream. You, you, you do the math. <laughs> so uh, the top, top players were purposely excluded from the tournament, so, you know, asked to give the rest of the competition a chance to place high in a yeah. tournament, which I think is a great idea. So who do you have winning the whole thing? My vote goes to Hart. I think Hart takes it. I would have to look at the signs probably, but wasn't the rule that like if you had like one top eight performance within the last right the way they excluded the top top players, I believe, is if you finished uh, at least if you have at least a quarterfinal finish in two S tier tournaments in the past year, mm -hmm. then you would be excluded from this. And there was a bit of a change there because freaking Andy yeah. would, would have been excluded by the early rules, but that they fixed it. I think they made it two two quarterfinal finishes instead of only one. To basically allow because it would be ridiculous if freaking Andy does not get the chance to participate in a tournament like this, right? Yeah, I, th I think like you had like Andy was available but uh, was not able to, but like Hart was able to, for example, something like that. Yeah, yeah and so like when you look at those two players, like they should be able to play the same tournament essentially. Absolutely, um, absolutely. I'm looking at the player list right now. I can see, I think Hart is seed one based on the way I'm seeing this. So mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. you went for the safe bet there, sir. <laughs> uh, next round is going to be Hart against Sebastian, though. That's going to be exciting. Ooh. There's a double elimination nice. here, by the way, uh, yep. to, to advance to the. Um... Oh, wait, no, no. Yeah. There's a double and elimination a double until elimination, sure. top eight. And then there's a single elimination, essentially. So Hart is definitely a good shout. I mean, Sebastian Hart, I think whoever wins that obviously will show you looking like they're very strong. Otherwise, you have names like Freaking Andy that will definitely sail as a favorite. Yeah, commit to a name, bruv. You never commit. Commit, I, I, bro. I'm a fence sitter, man. I like to sit <laughs> on the fence. No, I think... Oh, man, that's actually tough. There's so many names that are so similar in skill level here that it's really hard to say. Okay, let, let, let me look at the brackets. So, I, I can tell. We have like Hart, Gunji, Sebastian, Classic Pro, Barls, Fire, Kingston, Dragonstar, Freaking Andy, Sorakuma, Valas, Overtaken, Margugo, Daniel, Mihai, and Dark. A lot of players where it's like, okay, I could see all of them beat each other, right? But yeah, I think Hart, Sebastian, and maybe freaking Andy are the top three. I'm gonna let me quickly look at the map pool. Okay, map pool looks a bit weird. <laughs> okay, I think freaking Andy is gonna be the favorite. Thing. You know, Im imagine what a confidence boost it will be for one of these players to hear the Viper say he's gonna win. That that's Daniel, what I mean. Daniel Boom. is the ch gonna be champion. World Whoa, Rumble wait, two. Wait. Is Daniel on it? Danny he's boy. Loser. He's in the loser's bracket. He bro. lost to Margogo, but he will make a big comeback. <laughs> All right, there you go. <laughs> uh, and you know, as I said before, Microsoft does require hosts to sort of reach certain goals in order to keep sponsoring their tournaments. So I do hope OGN actually reaches his goals. And I say this because I know how tough it can be to get a lot of viewers for a tournament without Viper, without Hera, without Tato, and all of, all of these top players. So huge respect for him to actually taking the risk yeah. organizing a tournament like this but i think this does help the scene grow at those levels right i mean it's a very healthy price pool for second tier players i mean it feels harsh to call some of these players second tier players but it, it's a very nice boost for those to like that have the potential to reach the top spots in st tournaments but they haven't really made it to the like, top eight top four and now if they get it to top th top two top four they will have a solid payout here so Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a very nice initiative. Obviously, a little bit of risky in terms of like reach, because like you said, you're missing some of the big names. 
Um, but yeah, I'm all for this and very happy to see it. And uh, massive respect to OGN for doing that. Yeah, really, really massive respect for him to having the guts and to taking this risk. Okay, so folks, that was all from us today. Uh, we don't actually have a date to announce yet for our next episode. But again, we're going to mm -hmm. try to make it a little bit shorter and not monthly anymore, but twice a month. Uh, but I do know for a fact that a few spicy things will be announced uh, in the next coming weeks. So I'm hoping we'll be able to cover some of those <laughs> next, time, next time we meet Orient. All right, folks, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.